I'm Robin Bennett, and I am one of the co-founders of The Dog Gurus. Susan Briggs is the other co-founder of The Dog Gurus, and we help pet care businesses launch, grow, and profit. We provide business consulting services to pet care business owners, and we provide staff training programs for their staff. So welcome, everybody, for our weekly Facebook Live. And like I said, the topic today is going to be on dog evaluations, what they are, how to do them, why to do them, some tips on what happens if dogs don't do well during the evaluation. And we're going to talk about all of that in the next 30 minutes or so. So if you have questions, let us know. Otherwise, I will just let Susan kick things off with whatever intro you want to do on dog evaluations. All right. That, that gives me wide berth. So yeah, we have talked about dog evaluations forever and did a course. And I think if I was in, we did that in the context of evaluating dogs to be a good fit to your play groups or doggy daycare. But I think you can look at this bigger than that. It's make doing an evaluation to assess a dog for the services you provide. And I think that should be done whether you're a pet sitter or groomer, dog trainer, or doing doggy daycare and even lodging. I did a little bit of an evaluation for dogs that came into our lodging because not all dogs are a great fit. And right now we know that business is booming. So this is your opportunity to put a process in place to do an evaluation of the dogs and make sure they're a good fit for your center. The other thing is when you do an evaluation of the dogs, you can also do an evaluation of the client <laughs> and make sure the client's a good fit for your business and who you want to serve and that it's a good win-win proposition. And I think what's changed, Robin, since when we first talked about dog evaluations, it was that old pass-fail scenario. And we've changed that perspective to where let's figure out what is the best fit and whether that's my business great, but what service in my business is the best fit for the dog? So I think looking at it from what is your goal in doing the evaluation is to get a win for the pet, for the client, and for your business. Setting up your evaluation process underneath that ultimate goal, I think is what's important to step back and figure out that big picture first. Yeah. And I think for many people, they do that evaluation as a pass fail, which we would change the change that context, but they also don't take as much advantage, I feel like, as they could in terms of using the evaluation to actually recommend services. So yeah. years ago, we would do an evaluation and you'd go back out to the client and they were like, yay, he passed. What do you want to do now? And we completely changed all of that. Number one, like Susan said, it's less of a pass fail and more of let's see what your dog likes. But then the second part is when you are done with the evaluation, you should be going back to the pet parent and making a recommendation to them. So don't just go back and say, he seems to love daycare. So when do you want to come? We would be going back and saying, he really seems to enjoy it. On average, dogs really thrive if they come twice a week, or maybe he seems a little fearful. So Maybe you want to try once a week and see how he does. And then we could look at increasing it to twice a week. We, you will sometimes get pet parents that are like, oh, we want them here every day. And we actually discourage that to some extent. If you take dogs every day, we usually just recommend they have more rest the longer they're coming each day of that week. But you might get a pet parent that says, I want to come every week. And then maybe you can have a conversation with them about what that would look like and why maybe fewer days would be better. But and if they don't, if they happen to not like group play, it's your opportunity to go back out to that pet parent and say, you know what, he doesn't seem all that interested in playing with other dogs, but he loves being with our staff and we have a whole program where we can work with them one-on-one -on -one and do massage or tricks or whatever it is, whatever your program looks like. But the idea is you're using that opportunity to make a recommendation on the service you want for that particular dog. Don't just necessarily leave it up to the owner to decide. So I think that's another big change that we've seen in how evaluations are being used as well. So I was going to talk about, or I was going to ask you, Susan, okay. is what do you think? And for some reason, I my little like comment area, it does not exist. I don't know why. Oh, wait, no, maybe I found it. No, that's, I can talk to you this way, apparently. <laughs> Hang on. Well, this is interesting. Yeah. It says, I think that just went to you or I don't know. So I might have to comment on my phone, but if you guys have any questions, definitely leave them and 
in the comment section. I'm on Be Live, and for some reason, the normal thing that I type in doesn't show up. Who knows why? So I might have to improvise with using my phone at the same time. But anyway, what I was going to ask you to answer, Susan, was what do you think about charging for evaluation versus not charging for evaluation? And I'm a big proponent of scheduling no matter what, but so you have when dogs are coming in, but there, I think there's different ideas of whether or not you should charge for it. Yes. When I had my business, we definitely charged and I'm a big proponent of that for a couple of reasons. We didn't charge probably to where it would be considered a profitable service, but we did charge a fee. And what I found when I first started and I wasn't charging that I would get a lot of no-shows for appointments and that was frustrating. And so I think people respected the appointments more when there was a charge. And I also believe in getting paid for the services you provide. I think it sets you up as a professional that you're providing that evaluation and you want to help cover those labor costs because we would need two people to do an evaluation the way we did it at our business. It at least did help pay for my staff's time. Now, what you could do, uh, like we did an evaluation, if they bought a membership, then I would apply the cost of the evaluation to the membership. Or if they, I didn't apply it if they only did one day of daycare, but I would apply it if they bought a membership. So you could do something like that, but I think it shows that you're professionals and you're getting paid to do a service. Yeah. And I do think charging does help to eliminate people not showing up because they have an invested financial investment into it, as well as just wanting to find out more about their dog. And then it does allow you to cover your staff costs because you generally do need more staff on those days when you're going to do an evaluation. So unless you schedule it before you're opened or something, but typically you're scheduling an evaluation when dogs are there. So you usually are open. So the good news is my uh, little box came in now. <laughs> I typed something on the phone to say, if you had questions, let us know. And then that little box showed up on my computer. So I'm happy about that. Okay. So let's talk about some of the common questions we get. Number one, we'll talk about ways to do an evaluation in a second, but I know one of the questions we often get is, what dogs do you use? And especially if you're just opening, maybe you don't have a lot of dogs hanging out that you could use for an evaluation. If you're, but this is especially evaluations for group play. But then we also get questions. Do you tell the owners of the other dogs you're using them? And what do you, what do you decide on who to use? So there's a whole bunch of about that. So I'll start and then I'll toss it over to Susan. But for my starting point, I always say that the, by virtue of the fact that a dog is coming to daycare, that owner knows they're going to meet other dogs throughout the day. So I never got permission from the owner to use their dog as an evaluator dog. I did tend to pick dogs that were relatively low key and relatively non-reactive as my starter dog. So I would always do that. And, but I would just pick whoever I wanted to pick, like who was there that day. I didn't initially, when I first opened my business, I used my dog some of the time, but I also, and we would recommend when you're first opening, you want to have a few dogs there just for the appearance of having a business. So normally we would recommend inviting friends or neighbor's dogs who you would let come for free for a week or two until you build up some clients so that those dogs are there. And ideally those dogs, you want to have them be dogs that are good in group play as well so that they are good for evaluating. So I think those are the things to start with. I never, I never really did anything special regarding who I was going to pick. I just had dogs that I was going to use for evaluations. And I knew those dogs were coming on days that I had evaluations and I just rotated those dogs. So for Susan, I was going to have you talk a little bit more about, you know, what to look for in those evaluator dogs and rewarding them and making sure they aren't burning out and that kind of thing. So if you want to talk some about that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you want dogs, I think you want different behaviors. And I think definitely, as you said, Robin, those first dogs that you introduce, we call them an applicant dog to the new dog to those evaluator dogs. You want to know that they're not going to overreact, that they're going to be pretty predictable in, in how they're going to respond to meeting a new dog, which means you have to have dogs that enjoy meeting new dogs and not all dogs do. Shep 
one of my dogs, he loved being an evaluator dog. I think he loved that more than he loved going to daycare. So you're going to find those dogs that really like the role. And then you're going to find some like Archie didn't, he didn't like meeting new dogs. And so we rarely used him. So you want those kind of adults that are real rock steady. And then the evaluation of process, especially for group play, is you do want to see that as your opportunity to push the dogs, the um, applicants, dogs buttons just a little bit to see if they're pushed, how they may react, because you want to see that in this evaluation process and not when they're in with a big group of dogs. So we talk about that you may also want to have some button pushers. So this may be some of your juveniles who are a little crazy. Recently we we're down at the beach and I have a friend who has a, I think he's a 10 month old Parson Terrier who <laughs> licked JJ to death. His chin would be wet <laughs> and they would actually get into it because he was a terrier and he just wouldn't pull back. And there were times we had them both on leashes where they didn't get to interact because the puppy just couldn't pull back and wasn't reading JJ signals that he was just a little too much. He wasn't aggressive, but he was too much. And he could be a button pusher that we might put in to meet other dogs. And we always got information on the form. So if for some reason they said that a dog didn't like big black dogs, we might at least bring a big black dog into the room to see what's going to happen, um, actually going to cause a problem or not. What you're really wanting to determine during this evaluation process is focused on the body language. How does the dog respond to either polite behaviors or rude behaviors or something that's a little annoying? Is it an appropriate response in dog language that's going to be safe in your play groups? Yeah, and I think the evaluation process, especially for the dogs going into daycare, is really important to get a, a variety, two or three at least, initially, dogs of different, sort of different play styles and temperaments mm -hmm. so that you can see how that dog is going to respond to different dogs. And typically starting out with a low-key dog, but then you might bring in another dog that's a little more hyper or a little bit more active. And then you might bring in a dog that's more of a, like Susan said, sort of a button pusher that might just overwhelming and just see what's, how that new dog, the applicant dog re re responds to all those different activities. And in terms of just working with how to do the introduction, I'll talk about the way that we did it. Cause Susan and I actually did things differently. And the basic goal is you want to find out Number one, how the dog is with people, that's going to apply no matter what service you're looking at, whether it's lodging or boarding or lodging or daycare or training, whatever. Like you want to have a dog that is safe being handled and safe around the other dog, especially if you're going to put them in daycare because they're off leash. So it needs to be a dog that's comfortable around people that you can call over to you or you can put a leash on them and move them around or whatever. So you want to, that's one of the goals of the evaluation is making sure that dog is safe and comfortable around your staff. And then the second, especially for daycare is obviously, do they like other dogs? So the process that we used is we would bring the dog in initially on a leash and we did not have the owner stay and watch, which is one difference you'll see between Susan and me. Like I, my owners could watch if they wanted to from a window outside in the lobby, but I didn't have them come back in with me. And so we took the leash from the owner and then everything from that point on was the dog being handled by me and my team, my staff. So we would bring the dog in. We would do some initial in the lobby with the owner. We would do some initial petting the dog and touching the dog and making sure it was okay and comfortable with somebody new around it. And then we would bring them in on leash to the daycare area. All the other dogs were out. Usually we took them outside. If the weather wasn't good, we would just take them into another room, but they were out of the area where we were going to do the evaluation. And the dog just had a few moments. We would just drop the leash and let him wander around the room, smelling the room sometimes peeing on things, which was fine. We just cleaned that up and just checking out the room before anything else happened. Then we would pick the leash up and my daycare staff member, so one person's holding the applicant, the new dog, the applicant dog, and then a daycare member would bring in the first dog who we were gonna use for evaluation. And that dog was also on leash. So now we have two dogs on leash. They 
we watch the introduction and what we're looking for is appropriate body language. Maybe there's some stiffening initially, but we're looking for that to be relaxing as the dogs sniff each other. We're looking for appropriate greetings. We're looking for appropriate responses to one another. So if the dog, if either dog is uncomfortable and shows a t shows their teeth, we want the other dog to back up. So all those appropriate body language signals is what you're looking for. And ultimately we're looking for one of the dogs, if not both of them, ideally, to just relax and be like, whatever, it's another dog. Or maybe they start playing. Usually within a few seconds of that daycare dog coming in, we would drop the leash of the daycare dog and then usually take that leash off. The applicant dog is still on leash. And then we would do that sequence with two or three other dogs. So ultimately at any given time, two dogs are on leash, always one of them always being the applicant dog and then whatever new dog is coming into the room. Once we had a group of about four or five dogs in there, we would either usually drop the leash of the applicant dog if we felt like his body language was pretty good and that he was seemed to be pretty comfortable or at least not overwhelmed. And we would just let that group play together for a little while. And then from there, it depended on what happened. For, normally, if everything was going really well, we would usually introduce a few more dogs and just let that be a play group of like seven to 10 dogs and let the dogs be in that play group for an hour, two hours, depending on what was going on with, the, with all the dogs. And then if we thought the dog was comfortable, we, would, we might introduce him later in the day to a larger group of dogs. And that depends on, at that point, my largest group was usually about 20. So I started them out in a small group and some dogs did really well with seven or eight dogs and then not so well with 10 or 20. So I always like to introduce them in a small group and then also check to see how they are in a big group. And then from there, we just went through that sequence every day, not the introduction part, but the group part, which group they were going to be in every day and watch the dogs as they continued to come to daycare. So hopefully that makes sense. But Susan did a little bit differently. So I'll let you talk about your process. Yeah, I'll just talk about mainly the differences. We did invite pet parents to attend. We would have them sit in a chair and told them the most difficult thing they were going to have to do during that process was not to talk to or touch their dog during the evaluation. We wanted them to just disappear into the room. And then we used it as an educational opportunity. So we would describe the body language that we were seeing as dogs met. And we did do, like you did, introduce both dogs on leash. One of our staff members would have the applicant dog, one had the evaluator dog. One difference we did is once that introduction went and if they were off leash, we would take that evaluator dog out and then bring in a different one. So we only had two dogs in the room at a time um, to introduce about four or five, and then we'd bring everybody back and do a little play group. So it was similar, but different. And so our evaluations would take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to do that. And then at the end of them, if they wanted them to attend daycare and we thought it would work, we would introduce them um, to a play group. And then we would put some of those dogs up to do that initial introduction and get the play group back up bigger. If it was a really shy dog, we probably would recommend they not do that. And then we would talk to them about what days to bring them that would work best. And we had three different play groups that we could put dogs into outside of our tiny tails or puppy tail programs. We did keep puppies separate until they were about six months old. Our process was very similar. Sometimes on rare occasion, the dog would be so distracted having the parent in the room, we would ask them to go watch on the camera. But that didn't really happen that often. Most of the time we could have the pet parent in the room. And most of them were intrigued. If they just sat there on the phone, then we would stop doing our little description and just do our evaluation and, and move on with it. And so we didn't have issues with introducing dogs on leash because the pet parent was never on the leash. I know people ask about that. We never had that be an issue when it was our people holding the leash. And I know you asked me earlier to talk about rewarding evaluator dogs. And I want to circle back to that because it is stressful for dogs to meet all these new dogs. And so we really do want to make it a fun experience. Our evaluator dogs, after it was over, might get a special treat. They might get to come hang out in the office with us. Whatever they really enjoyed would be what we would try to do to reward them. And we would try not to have them do multiple introductions in one day and even give them days off just to make sure that they still enjoyed it. Yeah, and that's actually one of the questions we get all the time is, people email and say like, I have one or two dogs that I always use for evaluations, which is great.
but I want more than that because it does get exhausting for those dogs to be meeting, to be, to always be the dog that's meeting the new dog for the first time. And I think honestly, if you're using the same dogs over and over every day in and out, you will start to see some dogs, not every dog, you, but you will start to see some dogs that are like, oh, we're going, this is that whole sequence. Like the, the dogs figure out your sequence for how evaluations work. They know if they're going down the hallway because they're going to play or they're going down the hallway because they're going to meet a new dog. And if your dog really loves that role, like Susan was talking about, then that's great. But you will find some dogs that will start to slow down as they get to the door or they'll just indicate they don't want to do it that day. And I would honor that and say, okay, we're going to pick a different dog. So that's why I really like having a wider variety, a wider option for which dogs you're going to use, which obviously helps the bigger your facility gets and the more dogs you have as well. And then timing. So Susan mentioned hers would, her evaluation would be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour because she's educating the pet parent as she is doing the evaluation, which I think is great. And I actually think in today's day, you have to remember when Susan and I started doing these things, we like half of our conversations with owners were why you would want to bring the dog to daycare and what daycare was. So you have to remember like when we started our daycares, it was dog parks didn't exist, which I hard to believe that now as many dog parks and daycares as exist now. But most of our conversations were why would I bring my, like pet parents going, why would I bring my dog here? I have a backyard. Or does my dog want to play with other dogs? It's just totally different now. So a lot of our conversations were completely different. I do think now though, people are more interested in being right there with their dog when new things are happening. So I do think you might be more inclined to have a pet parent now that's that's skeptical. If you're like, let me just take your dog and evaluate them and you can't watch. I, so I would really look at, the opportunity to build that education into the pet parent. I also think it's a really good way to build trust with your pet parents because they're seeing everything you're doing. It's the same, it's the same issue that goes in the back of my head when, if I'm in a vet's office where the vet, all the vet exam happens right there in the office versus the vet exam, the exam that happens where the vet is, the vet tech says, let me just take my your dog back and the vet will do a quick exam. And I'm what, wait, where's my dog? Can't you do that in here? So I think that trust issue can really be helped by having that, the whole conversation with the pet parent, but it does take more time. So you have to build that in to your staffing and to your success rate in converting those clients into a paying client of some sort in your business. So you want to look at that too. When I was doing it without the client, it was, it would usually take us about, I would say anywhere from five to 15 minutes before we would know whether or not we want to try that dog in daycare. So it's a much shorter time frame. but I do think in today's day and age, you miss out on a big opportunity to get to know that client a little bit better and have them trust you a little bit more, which I think is really important. So. Yeah, we used it as an opportunity to explain the behaviors we were looking for and that we wanted to see. And I think it helped, as you say, build the trust and at least know that there was a consistent process all the dogs went through, that it would be the same. Yeah. And to go back to what we talked about earlier, where this whole evaluation is really all about you helping to help you and your staff trying to decide what is best for that dog. I think that's an easier conversation to have if you can explain some of the body language that you're seeing when the dog comes in. So if you see a dog that is a little bit more, and you do have to, you can't be really blunt with the owners. Like you do have to be careful about how you say things, but if their dog seems a little bit more nervous, then you can explain like, maybe we should start with just one day a week to give them time to build their confidence and be more comfortable. On the other hand, if the dog is clearly not comfortable at all in a play group environment, that's a great opportunity to say, you know what? We don't really think he likes this, but he probably would love some one-on-one attention. So if you have to tell the pet parent or make a recommendation to the pet parent about some other activity that you would offer that dog and it's not in line with what they came in for, I think that conversation is a little bit easier if they've seen the process and understand the process. I just thought about this, Robin. What I would do is I would have a climb in my evaluation room to where if we saw the dog wasn't enjoying that, you could introduce it to the climb and see, let them see how the dog responded to working and being- Yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
yeah then you could transition them or that's also a way to good way to introduce like enrichment activities right. for anything you're doing or even having any kind of equipment back there that they can walk on or step over or even agility equipment that they could do stuff with because that's a great idea and then they can try to you can talk to the owner about they don't really like this but they seem to really thrive on this kind of thing even having boxes in there with like now in my my brain is gone but even having boxes in there with a scent in them yeah. where you can say and especially for older dogs where they might not enjoy eight hours of playing with adolescents but you can say you know what we could do a little bit of that and then we've got obviously your dog loves to smell stuff we've got nose works and different scents and we can help them with that that's a really good idea i love that See? that's awesome just an idea off the top of her head all right so i think those are the i'm trying to think of other questions that we commonly get about evaluations i think where you get the dogs from the whether or not you should charge how to schedule how to do it in general. I will go back to Susan uh, about leash. We always get questions about leash reactivity. How can you introduce dogs on leash if they're leash reactive? And like Susan said, 99.9% .9 of the time, the dog is not reactive on leash when it is not the owner holding the leash. And that's been, that was my experience as well. We very rarely had a dog that we couldn't hold their leash and that, that they would be lunging and barking like that. Even when the owner said, reactive on leash it just never really happened when we were doing an evaluation because it's not the owner holding the leash so i do think i do think that mitigates all of that and i have seen folks do evaluations off leash so it's that happens in dog parks all around the country all the time people just put their dog in the dog park and most of the time things go well <laughs> the problem is <clears throat> if things don't go well i want a way to get that dog out of there as fast right. as i can and especially whether like my daycare dogs, I will take them off leash pretty quickly, primarily because I already know their behavior around other dogs, but I don't know this new dog. So it was always my a safety mechanism kicking, a safety kicking in saying, let's just have that dog on leash. That being said, you do need to train your staff to keep the leashes loose. And you do end up having to do this little maypole dance initially when you have two dogs on leash and they do the greeting ritual and they start sniffing each other's rear, you do have to make sure that you're handling the leashes in a way that the leashes don't get tangled. And believe me, your staff will get really good at that. At a given time, we only had two dogs on leash. Yeah, and I think the other thing, this is a role for your more experienced staff because you're having to watch the body language and reactions of two dogs at the same time. And you're also wanting to be proactive. So if you get a sense they're stiffening and you need to, separate the dogs, you would want to try to call them out and then the leash is the backup. So each person has to realize, oop, we need to separate. And so you're calling your dog when going to separate corners and letting them calm down. The doing evaluations is a promotion responsibility and you want your more experienced staff members um, doing it so that you ensure you keep the dog safe. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And then We'll talk really quickly about forms because I know we're about out of time. We do recommend formalizing your evaluation process. So as Susan mentioned earlier, every dog's going through the same process and it's a standardized process, which helps everybody feel more confident in the results. Because I know a lot of us, especially those of us that have been around dogs a lot, you just have a sense of when it's good or bad. That does not help your staff and you're not giving your staff any good feedback either. Even if the dog is good, in um, whatever environment you're going to put them in, even if they're really good in that, you might learn some things about them during the evaluation process that would be helpful for your staff to know. So we actually do have a formal um, process, a form that you can fill out and it's you can purchase it on our website, but it's also part of our dog evaluations online course. So if you're looking at um, taking a course to design your own evaluation process, it's included there as well. But our form, because we use the traffic management chart, which you've heard us talk about in the past, in terms of behaviors, we talk about red, yellow, and green behaviors in dogs. We actually came up with a evaluation form that categorizes the dogs. So by the end of the form, you actually have a score that tells you, is this dog red, yellow, or green? Which is helpful because if you are full, like initially we do find that people take any dog because they need the money. But right. we've talked about before that you really want to build your group. So you have no more than 20% yellow dogs and the rest are green and you shouldn't have any red dogs. And this is for daycare. 
but it helps because if you're starting to get full and you're doing a lot of screening of dogs, doing those evaluations and they're all yellow and then you get a green one, guess which one I would be more inclined to try to get into a more consistent schedule. It would be that green dog, especially if you have a lot of yellow dogs already. So that form can just help you to determine which dogs are most suited for your facility. And if what we typically see is people end up taking too many yellow dogs in the early stages and then after a couple of years, they're finding that their play groups are really hard to manage. And that's because they have so many yellow dogs in. So there may be some changes that you make after a couple of years in business. But that form does help to standardize the whole process. It helps to train someone else to take over the evaluations so that, like Susan said, as you get more experienced staff, you can have them start to learn that same process and everybody's doing things the same way. So you can check that out as well. Anything else that you want to talk about, Susan? No, you mentioned our course, and I think it is unique. It's the only course I know that really will help you do a great evaluation process, which is, we say there's two key things that keep your play group safe. And one is doing evaluations and knowing the dogs to accept. And then the second is that formal staff training process. So this is one of the key aspects to having safe and fun play groups, which is our goal. And I did put the link in there for the dog evaluations course. That's a um, one-time fee and you have three months access. So you'll get a user login for that, but you can share that login. If you more than one person that you want to take that course, you can share that login. And if you want to sit your whole team down in front of the computer and all go through it, you can do that as well. But you, but it, you just have to do all of that within three months of when you sign up because it's three months access to the course. So definitely check that out. And it does come, like I said, with that dog evaluation um, checklist and instruction form as well. 